This episode is brought to you in part by our friends and sponsors Ricky and Kelly at Groenfell Meadery in Vermont. They say be on the lookout for the ancient collection from Groenfell. Historic, high-strength meads in handmade ceramic bottles that will be available this holiday season. In the meantime, order delicious craft meads delivered to your door at Groenfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, November 5th, 2020. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Amal Terzin, author of A Year of Good Beer, a -a page-a-day calendar, joins us to talk about malt vinegar. Turn your beer into a tasty, tart condiment for fish and other delicious foods. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. And if you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basic brewing. And many thanks to everybody who is helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basic brewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. Steve Wilkes and I of uh, stevesbrewshop.com got together this week to uh, record a video episode on uh, my take of a dump beer. That's the, uh, if you'll remember, that's the style that uh, Adam Ross of, of Twin Span Brewing introduced us to. Uh, that uh, it, it uses wheat beer yeast on a barley beer, kind of a farmhouse style. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty happy with the way mine turned out. Uh, I used Munich malt. Uh, both the, m- m- most of it is the 10 love of bond, but then there's a little bit of the 20. Uh, and I think it's a nice balance of the, uh, the caramely characteristics of that malt. And uh, the fun flavors uh, coming from the yeast. I used Imperial G01 Stefan for that one. Uh, And uh, we also recorded our next malt sampler show that featured uh, black malts, uh, Midnight Wheat, uh, Black Prince, and Black Patent. Uh, Man, that was a a fun show uh, to do. Um, They're all super delicious beers. And... um, you know, it may inspire the next full batch beer that I brew because uh, I was so impressed with those uh, the combinations. Uh, were we able to pick which was which? Well, tune in to find out here in a, in a couple weeks. I uh, also on the home brewing front, I kegged my version of a, a recipe that was inspired by a recipe of mine <laughs> this week. Uh, our friend Greg McGill down at uh, Brewocracy down in Hamilton, New Zealand, uh, challenged me to uh, come up with a collaboration recipe. Uh, Greg has been listening since the very, very beginning, uh, back in 2005. Um, I picked, you know, he asked me for a recipe, and I picked my rye wit, uh, which is not really a wit, uh, but it's a low-gravity beer with only rye and wheat uh, in the malt bill. And uh, Greg took up the challenge, but he hopped it up with a bunch of uh, Nelson Savin hops and a bit of Centennial. So, you know, kind of a cross, cross-cultural cross uh, uh, blend there. Um, and uh, when I tasted the wort, the unfermented wort, I was a little afraid that the beer was going to be too bitter. Uh, but I think it turned out great. And with an ABV of only a 1.7 percent, uh, it's going to be good going into the holiday season to counteract all the goodies uh, that we'll have uh, I plan to have Greg on the show uh, in the future to talk about how his uh, Kiwi customers uh, liked the beer, or or if they didn't. <laughs> uh, I brewed that beer with the AO7 flagship from our friends and sponsors at Imperial Organic Yeast, uh, and the flagship really let that hop character shine. And speaking of Imperial Organic Yeast, we have a new recipe from Imperial on the basicbrewing.com slash recipes site. That's our our small but growing collection of tasty recipes on basicbrewing.com. This month's is called uh, Palaver Porter. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. From Chris Toscano of the Imperial Customer Service Team. Uh, Palaver is apparently a Scottish word meaning unnecessarily elaborate or complex procedure. (laughs) Chris named this uh, porter that way because it has seven different malts. Pilsner, Victory, uh, Vienna. Kara Crystal Wheat, German Carafa One, German Kara Hell, and Flaked Barley. Mmm! It sounds delicious. 
Uh, Palaver Porter uses uh, Imperial A31 Tartan yeast, which is a traditional strain that accentuates the malt character of Scottish and other malt-forward styles, but it can also be used for other styles and works well in IPAs due to its clean fermentation character. Uh, check out Chris's recipe on basicbrewing.com slash recipes, or you can just hit the, the recipe button up there in the menu bar uh, just by going to basicbrewing.com. You know we love Imperial Organic Yeast. I like to say my stir plate is dusty because I don't use it to make starters anymore for moderate gravity five-gallon batches. With an industry topping 200 billion cells per easy-to-open package, fermentation is a breeze. Ask your local homebrew shop for Imperial Organic Yeast and check them out at imperialyeast.com. That's imperialyeast.com. I'm getting a lot of good disaster stories for our end-of-the-year disaster show. And uh, there may also be a multimedia component, <laughs> thanks to a spooky video that I got yesterday. Uh, ASMR fans will be very happy. <laughs> uh, it seems like the theme this year is spraying and or exploding. So be sure to put that on your uh, disaster show bingo card when you after you print that out. Uh, Steve Wilkes and I are planning to record in early December uh, so please get your stories in by the end of November. Send them to james at basicbrewing.com. You know what would lessen your chances of having a brewing disaster? A Warthog Electric Brewing System from our friends and sponsors Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. Let's face it, there's no guarantee that you won't have a disaster of some sort with any system, but, you know, human nature. But you know what you won't have with a high gravity electric system? The cold winter wind blowing out your propane burner or stealing your heat away. Running out of propane in the middle of the boil. A dramatic loss of heat as you wrap your old-fashioned mash tun in your grandma's homemade quilt. <laughs> A Warthog system from HighGravityBrew.com will take the pain out of propane. My Warthog EBC-130 uh, system is... Uh, the, the controller is like a brew buddy, heating up the strike water for me, keeping an eye on the mash temperature in maintaining a nice, steady rolling boil. Uh, you've seen it on the show. I have the single-vessel 240-volt system, but you can design your own system from 5 gallons all the way up to 2 barrels. Single, dual, or three-vessel configurations. And, if you insist, you can buy electric systems from other manufacturers from HighGravityBrew.com. Configure the electric system of your dreams and tell Santa all about it. And if you use the code EBC75BB, you can save 75 bucks off your electric gear purchase. That's at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. That's HighGravityBrew.com. Okay, I don't think we've talked about malt vinegar before. Those who have gone through the archives may prove me wrong, but if we have talked about it, it's, it's been so long that it's time for a revisit. Let's talk to Amal Turzen. Amal Turzen, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you, James. Happy to be here. Well, I'd welcome. Uh, I was reading a Zymergy magazine, and uh, I saw your article on malt vinegar, and I said, you know what? I don't, I don't think we've talked about malt vinegar on the show. So I said, oh, I'll just have a mall on, and and we'll we'll knock that out. So it's amazing yep. that we've we've found a topic that uh, in you know fifteen years plus uh, we haven't talked about. That's great. <laughs> so so tell us about yourself uh, introduce yourself Amal um, well I've been brewing for about 35 years um, and I started off in San Luis Obispo um, and I did it professionally for about 7 years so um, I just homebrew now and uh, do a little bit of writing about beer and a little bit of editing for a couple of beer magazines, the, the New Brewer, uh, which is a trade magazine, and Zymergy, which is a homebrew magazine. But um, I love talking about beer, and uh, <laughs> I'm always willing to do so. Malt, malt vinegar is one of those things that um, you, you, can, you can play with if you happen to have a batch of beer that you're not quite satisfied with. Um, I've always <laughs> found that it's a, it's a good... Um, sort of secondary process that you can get into. But. And and some people in the listening now have probably uh, accidentally made malt vinegar. 
Well, Acetobacter are, are tenacious little creatures, and they can ruin a brewery. So you you really have to exercise caution um, when you're making beer and vinegar in the, in the same locale. Now, let's step back a second. And the, where I'm familiar with the malt vinegar, or at least my introduction to malt vinegar, was uh, on the table of the uh, local Long John Silvers. Uh, and uh, I don't know that I'd, I had heard of malt vinegar before, you know, I saw that, you know, as a teenager. So what exactly is malt vinegar? Well, um, most people are familiar with wine vinegar and cider vinegar, but really you can take any ethanol solution and add acetobacter, a culture, um, and it will, those bacteria will change the ethanol into acetic, uh, acid. And that, of course, is what makes the uh, the vinegar tart. So malt vinegar is simply um, the same process, only you're using you're starting with um, a malt based fermentation. Now you say that any any beer can be made into uh, malt vinegar, but are there better beers, or, or beers that are better at uh, being malt vinegar than others? Absolutely. Um, really, what you want to do is start with little to no hop bitterness. Um, because bitter malt vinegar is just not that great. Um, so it doesn't really matter how strong the beer is because you would want to dilute it, uh, before you start the, um, vinegar process, ideally between 5.5 and 7% alcohol is where you want to be. Um, but pretty much any beer style, um, as long as it's not heavily hopped, will work and for that matter um mead or braggot oh i i hadn't thought about that uh, so so do you get uh, a lot of the residual flavors of the beer in the final vinegar product you do um i made one from a braggot that i really enjoyed um most recently there was a doppelbach that just didn't quite attenuate like it should um I am a big proponent of drier beers. I like malty beers, but I don't want them just cloying and sticky. Hmm. Um, I've done a Scotch ale before, and um, there's one. It was it was actually a wee heavy that uh, I made in 1998, and um, I was working at a health food store at the time. I got a really good deal on a bucket of malt extract. Well, um, I decided to to go with a 39 Plato original gravity uh, wee heavy, and it was of course very very lightly hopped. Well, it only got down to 11 Plato. That was the finishing gravity, hmm. um, and it just was undrinkable. So, made that one into vinegar, and it was actually probably my most successful vinegar to date. It was uh, it's very malty. You get a nice malt aroma. Uh, and of course, it's been aging for you know years now, and aging tends to mellow your malt vinegars. So, um, so yeah, this this stuff is great. But there are lots of lighter styles; they don't have to be heavy. I would imagine doing a um, something like a wit beer would make a really nice vinegar, which you could then spice with coriander and fresh orange peel. Mm. That might be great with um, something like you know moule frite or or uh, something like that. So wide variety of styles. Now, we here at the house don't use a lot of vinegar. Do you, when you make uh, uh, malt vinegar, do you make full five-gallon batches? I, uh, not intentionally. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I usually try and keep them fairly small. You know, a gallon is a lot of vinegar. Um, like you, I enjoy making hot sauces, but malt vinegar tends to be a little harsh for hot sauce. Um, but... You can use it for pickling, and of course, it's great, you know, with any sort of fried food, um, onion rings, um, tempura, and of course, you know, fish and chips. Mm -hmm. So, lots of culinary uses. But no, you don't go through a whole lot, so you don't want to go crazy with your with your batch of size. Uh, Christmas presents. That's what. There you go. <laughs> holiday, yeah. holiday yeah. present, birthday presents. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, here comes them all with his vinegar. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll just throw this in the trash. Right? 
So speaking of uh, throwing things in the trash, you don't you don't want to uh, to uh, risk uh, making garbage out of your uh, your clean beers. Uh, so you, in the article, you recommend having uh, just a completely different set of gear uh, for your for your vinegar and, and marking it as such. Absolutely, yeah. It's um, it's very easy to to, to transfer and cross contaminate um, those Acetobacter tend to stay in things like plastic hoses and plastic buckets. And you're really, you know, when you ferment uh, vinegar, it, uh, you want to do it in a wide vessel. So I know a lot of home brewers would be tempted to use a five, the old dependable five gallon bucket. But if you're using it for brewing, um, it's going to transfer over and you'll get large batches of vinegar that you don't want. So yeah, if, um, and also, if you can sort of remove the process from where you usually do your brewing, and especially fermenting, um, those bacteria have a have a way of traveling. Mm. So just exercise extreme caution. So and it, it like move it to the garage or or move it to the basement or move it to wherever your brewing is not. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. I have my all my vinegar works and equipment I keep under the sink in the basement. Um, away from my brewery operations and knock on wood i've been lucky so far now where do we get started i mean what uh you know do you how do you find the bugs uh to turn beer into vinegar well the the best policy is is to really go to your local homebrew shop um most of them carry uh what's called a mother which is the um the culture and uh it's it's just this big ugly rubbery thing that, that usually comes in a jar, um, and you can just purchase those um, at the brew shop and do that. You can also um, go to your local market. Uh, a lot of markets sell organic apple cider vinegar with the mother, and it will say that on the label. Uh, that's perfectly okay to use too as a as a starter culture. Huh. So it sounds a whole lot like uh, kombucha. Yes. Uh, in fact, the SCOBY, uh, that symbiotic culture of yeast and bacteria that's used for, for kombucha brewing, is very similar to a vinegar mother. Um, it's just that the vinegar mother is just the acetic bacteria hmm. without, without the yeast. So, Do you have to make a, a starter before you pitch it into your beer? No, you don't. It's actually very simple. And... Um, and also the nice thing is, you know, once you start your um, acetic fermentation and that process gets going, it, it takes a couple of months usually, but then you can, it will form a pellicle, um, kind of a rubbery lid on top of the liquid. Um, and that's your mother and it'll sink down into the liquid later, but you can save that in a jar and, um, and use it for subsequent uh, batches of vinegar. So the, typically, uh, when you look at uh, uh, kombucha, <clears throat> the uh, the scoby or the the mother uh, floats on the top. Mm -hmm. uh, but does it is, does the uh, acetobacter does the vinegar mother is it does it live on the bottom or after it's done, does it go to the bottom? It, yeah, it'll um, it'll stay on the top for a while and then it'll eventually um, dislodge and float to the bottom. Although I've had them stay on top for for a long time too, they kind of get stuck there. How long will a uh, mother last? Indefinitely, if you keep feeding it. Hmm. So they're yeah, they're uh, they're tenacious little bugs, and they'll they'll stay together in that colony. And um, there is actually a, a process called the Orleans process of making vinegar, where it's a bit like the Solera technique, where you have a barrel or a drum that you cover, um, and you just continually feed this um, your ethanol solution. And it, it will take two or three months to um, to finish out. You'll remove three quarters of the batch of vinegar, and then you'll replace that with your new ethanol solution, and you'll just keep that going. Hmm. And I imagine that way you could kind of temper your uh, the product. I mean, you could take some some out before it's completely done, maybe, and uh, put it in the fridge and and save it there. Well, you want to make sure that it. It uh, completely finishes, and your nose will tell you when it's done um, because it it breaks down um, ethanol into acetic acid. But there are a, 
a couple of compounds sort of along the way that aren't too pleasant. Um, one of them is ethyl acetate, which kind of smells like nail polish mm. remover. Um, so that's not something that you want. Acetylaldehyde, uh, acetaldehyde is another one. And as you know, that is sort of a green apple aromatic. Um, and I've had batches that still have a little bit of that in there and they just need more time, a little more oxygen perhaps, um, and correct temperatures to, to finish out. So with the kombucha, you can, you can't, you know, it's, uh, I guess a little less of a complex uh, fermentation maybe because, you know, you can steal some out of there uh, while it's still a little bit sweet, you know, if that's your preference. Yeah. Yeah. And as long as you don't, you know, put it in a pressurized vessel, it's going to blow up if it, you know, keeps uh, working. Uh, you can enjoy it, you know, before it's completely done. But it sounds like uh, uh, this vinegar fermentation, uh, you have to be a little bit more patient. Yes, you do. You really, you really want it to be um, absolutely done before you bottle it. Um, but once your nose tells you and you taste a little bit um, and it tastes, you know, like clean vinegar, then you can add whatever spices you want um, or herbs. You know, tarragon is, is a classic one for wine vinegar. Um, then you can bottle it and you want to bottle it without um, oxygen. Hmm. Oxygen is necessary uh, to get it where it's going. But um it is possible for your your acetic acid to uh, be converted back to water and CO2 if it's exposed to too much oxygen. So you want to um, bottle it without O2. And some people also pasteurize their vinegars. Huh. So when you're when you're making the product, you put your beer in your in your bucket that you say goodbye to as far as the <laughs> normal yeah, the normal brew. brewing. <laughs> And just uh, toss in the uh, toss in the mother. I mean, do you have to? Do you, would it, is it wise to add oxygen at that time? You can certainly splash. Uh, you know, when you're using a beer, it's probably going to be a little bit carbonated. Um, so you want to get that carbonation out. So you want to treat it like you would a mead, where you kind of whisk it, get all the gas out, um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, you want sort of a wide fermenter which can be a mason jar if you want, um, if you're making a small batch. And then, yeah, it's just as easy as, uh, as adding the mother. If you're going with the um, apple cider vinegar with the mother, you want the sediment from the bottom, but the vinegar also will contain acetobacter. So um, it's very, very easy to, to pitch and go with this process. Now, with a beer, you'd want to put an airlock on uh, to keep uh, the CO2 in and the, and the oxygen out. Uh, but what's the approach with vinegar? With vinegar, it's just the opposite. You want as much exposure to oxygen as possible. So um, you would just cover it with cheesecloth or um, something that will keep out insects. Now, um, fruit flies are a big pain with vinegar making. They will get in um, because they absolutely love the stuff. So you want to keep them out, and cheesecloth is a great way to do it or some sort of screening on top. I've seen a video on YouTube where uh, uh, someone was didn't they chose the wrong kind of uh, cheesecloth that was a little too you know the gaps were a little too wide and the flies yeah. actually got in there uh, <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't wasn't very pretty no. <laughs> so so make sure that your cheesecloth is, is of the thread count uh, where you know the little flies can't get in there yeah otherwise you end up with a, a, a super crunchy salad. Ooh. <laughs> A little extra protein, as they say. Protein. There you go. <laughs> it just tastes like vinegar. <laughs> and I'm sure it's safe. You know, all that acid, you know, is probably uh... a <laughs> legal disclaimer. It's probably not safe. Uh... <laughs> Let's take a quick break from talking to them all to talk about our friends and sponsors at Tavor. If you listen to this show... You know about Tavor, it's a way to select delicious craft beers that you may not be able to find in your area and have them delivered to you. How handy! It's not a beer of the month club when someone chooses beer for you and it's a surprise when it comes at your door. You only pay for the beer that you choose over the course of the month. Signing up for Tavor is free. Just create an account at Tavor.com. That's T-A-V as in Victor, O-U-R.com. 
and download their iPhone or Android app. You'll receive notifications for two new beers each day that are available for purchase with in-depth tasting notes from Philip at Tavor. This month, look for selections from W.A. Meadworks, Best of Hands Barrel House, Alpha Acid, Cider Core, Charlestown Fermentary, Adventurous Brewing, and Pivot Brewing. If you're not interested in the beers that you see every day, no worries, just skip the ones you don't want. However, when you see something that you do want, and you will, just click on it and add it to your crate. Your beer arrives fresh every few weeks, allowing you enough time to, to uh, fill a box and pay the least shipping. Why don't you check it out? It doesn't cost anything to sign up, and there's no obligation to purchase anything. In fact, if I can ask you a favor, go to Tavor.com, T-A-V as in Victor, O-U-R.com, or download the app, and when you sign up, enter the promo code BASICBREWING, all one word, and you'll get 10 bucks off your first shipment of $25 or more. Again, it's free to sign up, and there's no obligation to purchase. Sign up at Tavor.com or with the Tavor app and enter Basic Brewing as the promo code. So, so how long uh, how long do we wait? Um, and and do and is there a benefit to aging? Um, those are two, yeah, two separate questions. You you want to um, make sure that you not only have sufficient oxygen. Um, you also want the right temperature range, which is ideally 80 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and you want it steady. You don't want it to be fluctuating. But at that temperature and with sufficient oxygen, you're looking at four to six weeks, probably. And, and how can you tell when it's done? Just the smell? Yeah, just um, sampling it. You probably want to leave it alone for the first month. But then you can go in, um, I have a little syringe that I can go into, you know, a bucket with, just take a little bit out because you don't need much um, and just smell it, taste it. And if you detect some of that um, green apple um, from acetaldehyde, you you want to let it go, um, maybe whisk it a little bit, get more oxygen in. Um, but yeah, the best way is really sensory evaluation. And then uh, you can you could bottle it at that time, but uh, there are other also uh, some other options, more interesting options for your vinegar. Yeah, um, it's certainly okay to to pasteurize it. Um, it needs to be between 140 and 160 degree Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. You can do that with a hot water bath, um, and then once it's pasteurized, you know all those bacteria are are killed off. And it's stable, and it'll be stable indefinitely. Hmm. So that's a great idea for making gifts. Um, but you can also bottle it with flavorings, as we've mentioned. You can do herbs or spices. And what about the barrel aging? Barrel aging is another direction to go. And, um, you know, as you mentioned before, kind of say goodbye to that barrel because it's not going to be good for anything anything else. But, <laughs> um, but the wood does tend to mellow out the vinegar quite quickly. Um, you can also use the wood chips that you find at your local homebrew shop. Um, so you can age in glass with wood chips. But, you know, four to six months of aging can really do wonders for mellowing out your vinegar. It's going to be hot and spicy when, you, when it's first done. Um, just really sharp, acetic. But, um, but that'll... The, the flavors tend to mellow after a couple of months, especially if you're using wood. Yeah, it sounds delicious. Uh, with the vinegar probably taking up some of the, you know, the the tannins and the in the uh, the vanilla and and such as that from the from the wood. Um, yeah, yeah, sounds and great. If you, have, if you have a nice malty beer like a you know a Doppelbach or a Scotch ale, you know you you really get that um, that sort of barrel beer quality in there as well so it can be very complex wonderful stuff now with uh, along with uh, uh, kombucha uh, there are uh, people that say there are, are medical or medicinal uh, properties of uh, you know an active live vinegar what's what's the word on the street Amal well um, you know that there are a couple of different bacteria that we that have health benefits um, you know, obviously, lactic acid bacteria are a very popular one in brewing for making sours. Um, acetic is a much sharper acid, so 
that's why brewers de- generally don't want, want that in their beer. But, um, you know, live active vinegar can be very good for you. And uh, um, I, I know a lot of breweries use a purified form called parasitic acid um, for actually sanitizing. But um, obviously, and those those have been purified and the, the bacteria have been killed off. So mm. there's there's no cross-contamination risk there. And similar with uh, uh, with the health benefits, if you did do a, a pasteurization uh, of the vinegar, then the the potential health benefits if you're if you're looking to get live you know bacteria in your gut, uh, if you pasteurize it, that's neutralized. That is correct, um, but it it may be preferable if you a want a really shelf stable product and b don't want to accidentally let those live bacteria loose in your kitchen or brewery. So there, <laughs> there are good reasons for pasteurization. <laughs> good for your gut, but not necessarily for your, <laughs> your, your carboy or your brew pot. Right. Um, so, so what, uh, wh- what have we missed? Uh, it sounds like, uh, other than making sure that your sanitization is a hundred percent, uh, it sounds like turning, you know, delicious or or maybe not so delicious beer into uh, vinegar is a fairly straightforward uh, process. It is. Uh, it's very easy to do. It just takes some patience. And um, if you experiment with different styles, you just have to realize that some work better than others. Um, I I have made vinegars out of beer that had just a little bit too bitter, too much bitterness from hops. And they just didn't work, and I had to toss them. So, mm. um, so pick something you know, ideally malty, sweet, uh, under attenuated, and uh, those tend to make some really nice malt vinegars. Well, excellent. Well, in addition to your work and the publications, you are also a published uh, author as well. What what products have you got out? Well, um, back in two thousand nine, Charlie Papazian was doing a page a day beer calendar. He was doing reviews um, and he just got too much on his desk. He asked, asked me very nicely to, uh, to help him out with those reviews. And I've been working on um, a year of good beer. It's a page a day calendar from Workman Publishing. And um, I now am responsible for all content and uh, they make great gifts. So, Check it out. <laughs> and where, where can we find those? Uh, just on Amazon or anywhere that uh, uh, fine uh, beer-related books are sold? Exactly. Yeah, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, bookstores. And the uh, 2021 is available now. So how, what's, the, what's the process in that? I mean, how do you gather the beers to review? I mean, do you, do you have sources all over the country? I try and sort of integrate my reviews with my travel. Um, so I see family uh, on the West Coast and East Coast and um, friends, and I try and do reviews while I'm there. I bring my iPad and, um, and get interesting beers from different places. I, you know, there are a lot of great breweries here in Colorado, but um, the, the more beers I can get from different parts of the country, the more interesting the calendar is, I think. For sure. I mean, it's a, it's a moving target nowadays. There's so many, uh, so many good breweries coming online. It's not difficult to find great beer. Um, <laughs> just with distribution the way it is these days. But, um, I also love the, the tiny hyper local nano brewery beer too. Cause I want, you know, I, I want people to walk into those places and, and try their products. Well, good for you. You're uh, you're a brand ambassador to uh, a lot of, uh, well, I guess, 365 uh, uh, breweries a year. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work out to quite that many. Um, there is other content in there, but uh, but yeah, at least uh, about 250 um, reviews of, of beer. And I love supporting uh, craft breweries all over the place. So um, so it's a lot of fun. Excellent. Well, this has been a lot of fun, uh, and uh, I hope that uh, you know we can get together again uh, with another uh, interesting topic in the future. That sounds great, James. I really appreciate your asking me to to partake this time. 
Well, thanks again to Amal. Look for his page at a calendar called A Year of Good Beer. Man, I could go for a year of good beer. <laughs> Maybe 2021 uh, will be that. Uh, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies always come in your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. Talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long. So long.